Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2018 Bilfinger Capital Markets Day at the Trade Fair Achema. We thank you for taking the time to join us, spend this day learning more about our services, and meeting almost the whole Bilfinger management team. We will start now with the presentations, which will be recorded, and the replay will be later on available on our web page. We have reserved some time for Q&A after a set of presentation, as you can see in the agenda, which is in your folder. The Q&A part, however, won't be replayed on our website. It's just the presentations. We will hold a lunch break at around 1 p.m. and we will move to the trade fair stand at around 3 p.m., concluding the day with a tour of our exhibits taking the customer's perspective. But now, let us start with the opening comments of our CEO, Tom Plates. Okay, thank you, Bettina. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And also on behalf of uh, the entire management team, Michael Bernard, Klaus Patzak, and all the guys in the front row here, uh, welcome to Billfinger 2018 Capital Market Update. Uh, the bottom line is we're on track, our strategy holds, there is no change, and we're making progress. And to show you that, we're going to run through um, today, I think, a strong focus on operations. It's not about financial numbers, it's about uh, what we do, how we do it, how we're doing it well, what we're doing next, and where we're headed. So with that, um, maybe I'll just take you back uh, a few slides to Capital Market Day, February uh, 2017, when we unrolled not only our strategy, but also our execution plan. At that time, we showed you that we intended to organize along two segments, as we call it, ENT on the one side, um, focusing on the customer's CapEx requirements, and then on the other side, MMO, maintenance, modifications, and operations, focusing on the customer's OPEX side. We showed you that um, the way we would structure ourselves would be around the customer, essentially, which is why the MMO part is a customer-centric organization. We're in four regions. And then the ENT part is more focused on project. For us, it was very important to drive uh, best practice, global best practice sharing, governance, which is why the ENT part is structured internationally and the four MMO regions are structured regionally. We have a large market. Um, our view on the market hasn't changed. Um, it is significant. It was 231 billion in 2016, growing to 256 billion by 2020. That's the overall market. A large part is outsourced. Uh, we showed that to grow from 125 to 143. We believe in that. And we also showed you that not only do we have the four regions, but we focus on six key industries that hasn't changed. The three major ones deliver 80% of our revenue. The others are growth industries that we will move into. We showed you, uh, based on our market uh, studies and on the profit pools, as we call them, our ambitions towards target ranges for both ENT and MMO. Those target ranges haven't changed. Neither have um, our steps going forward. We showed you also how we will address each of the line items that uh, deliver into our commitment to reach a 5% bottom line by 2020. That's an EBITDA bottom line. 2% coming out of gross margin improvement and then 3% coming out of sg &A. I think uh, all of that uh, is just a quick recap. Uh, our aspirations where we want to be in 2020 are known to you. And as I said at the beginning, that hasn't changed. Yeah? So we're a little bit boring. But the good news is we're on track and our plan works. I'm now going to bring you up to date and uh, probably show you numbers that you know already. But I think important is to appreciate what's behind the numbers, the story, the momentum, and where we're headed. First out of the box is uh, ENT. ENT has been more difficult, as you're well aware. Uh, one of the, the major uh, issues, items, or headlines in 2017 was what have you done with power? As you recall, power was put up for sale uh, before I arrived, um, before Klaus arrived, I think just after Michael arrived. And we spent more or less a year prior to that time trying to divest power. Nobody wanted it. We took it back on board. 
we dissected it, uh, we reallocated it, uh, we moved portions into ENT, others we moved into other operations, we held those for sale, I'll come back to that. Today, the ENT is uh, a lot stronger, uh, it's not where we want it to be quite yet. Uh, for us, it's moving through the stabilization phase, it'll exit when we've done four successive quarters with positive results, that's the green boxes at the bottom of the page. We're quite bullish that that'll be at the end of Q2. So we're moving out of the stabilization phase with ENT. We're not yet in the, the margin bandwidth where we would like to be. But what we do see is that after declining large projects, you know, we turned away large projects, anything over 100 million, uh, we turned our back on in 2016 and 17. We've now got to the point where risk is understood. Risk is part of our uh, management process. Risk is combined with uh, costs or price, if you like. It's combined with a contract. And therefore, we feel confident in taking back on board larger projects, triple digit projects. And you will have read about one of those in, uh, in April that we won for Linda Braskem. Uh, Terry Ivers uh, from North America will share with you when he does his presentation on what is different today than a number of years ago with respect to risk and large projects. As I said, that's in April. So um, you know, our forward view on order intake is also bullish, and that's why we stand by our commitments. Nice to see if I take Q1, Q1 2018 versus Q1 2017, we have a 16% uh, growth in order intake, 18% organic. I mean, that's a tremendous step forward, and I think it's uh, credit to the team that they've been able to bring us this far. And I think going forward, you'll also hear from uh, Michael Lefferman, who runs the NT division, exactly what is in store, what other innovative programs we have on the cards. If I move forward to MMO, it's a lot more stable already. Uh, we're in the bandwidth we've allocated ourselves. That's on an annual basis. On a quarterly basis, it will jump up and down. Uh, but also here, the big story is uh, orders. Uh, one of the things that you questioned um, at the capital market day was, you know, can we grow in a mature market? Can we grow in a market that's showing a 3% uh, plus CAGR? And the answer is yes, we can. And that answer is again provided here in the numbers in Q1. We were 19% 19% higher than in the previous year, organically 22% higher. So the momentum is there. We're moving forward. And a lot of the things we're doing around innovation, especially digitalization, is creating pull through, but more of that later. Bottom line is MMO is stable. We can rely on it, it's predictable, and it's essentially our bread and butter. We're in the right space. As we go forward, we want to take MMO to new levels in the Middle East. Ali Vezvai is here to share that with you, to share our vision on the Middle East, and to show you that there's more growth in the pipeline. If I add it all up together, of course, there are still some elements missing, the uh, other operations, or OOP as we call it, but the overall picture for Bill Finger is a positive one. Uh, Q1 was negative on the EBITDA. We're quite optimistic on Q2, but uh, it's still one month ago, obviously, but uh, I think we're tracking in the right direction. What I like here in particular is that, you know, we fulfilled our commitments, we're delivering on additional commitments, and that top line is moving, moving in the right direction, going upwards. Order intake uh, for the entire Bilfinger Group in Q1 was 21% up on the same quarter, 2017. We're moving. I'd like to take it down one level now. And uh, as I mentioned, the delta between MMO plus ENT is, of course, other operations. Other operations, uh, when we shared the plan with you, uh, comprised of uh, a total of 18 companies. Many of these were ex-power. Of these 18, we divided them into 13, which were dilutive, so they were loss-making. Five were accretive, and the dilutive ones we put high on our priority list to solve. A solve meaning either fix it, sell it, or close it. Of those 13, we said we'd be done by the middle of 2018. Check mark, uh, they're complete. 12 have been sold. Uh, number 13 is a JV. Uh, we've terminated the JV. The JV partners put the company into receivership, so also that one is off our books and no longer drawing cash or drawing management attention. Of the five accretive companies, labeled here four plus one, one we've brought back into the fold. That's uh, VAM in uh, Austria. As we went through our strategy, 
we were um, getting a lot of pull from the customers in terms of turnarounds. And uh, VAM is an excellent company, not only for project work, but also for turnarounds. And that's why we've reintegrated them into continental Europe to address what is actually a, a wave of turnarounds coming our way in uh, 2018, but even stronger in 2019. So meeting our commitments, reorganized power, we've regrouped some of the other power entities into a stronger company called BET. Um, they're looking very good on nuclear and some other innovative items which uh, Michael will share with you as I mentioned. On the right, we also show the number of total legal entities within the Bilfinger Group. At the height of our acquisition spree, you know, some years ago, we had over 600 companies. Uh, when we shared with you Capital Market Day 2017, we were at 232. We're now down to 189 and still moving downwards. A little over 90 of those are operational, generating cash. Many others were holding because they have uh, tax advantages. Um, I'm sure many of you know that we have actually 200 million euros, that's the undiscounted number, 200 million euros in tax loss carry forward. Now, of course, you need to make profit to use that. We're on the way. So we like that number, we like those entities, but as we use up those uh, tax loss, we will also reduce complexity by taking out companies, combining others, being more transparent, being more efficient, and acting more as one billfinger rather than many small companies. I think, again, hats off to the team that um, executed on those sales. They weren't always easy, and often we had to give money with the company, but uh, we stemmed the cash flow, and that is now behind us. Speaking of team effort, compliance uh, is and remains a big team effort throughout Billfinger. Uh, this really shouldn't be underestimated. Um, compliance is part of our culture in the meantime, part of what we do. It also uh, added up to more than 100 million in external spending, more than 100 million external spending. But what I think really uh, knocks people back is we did a study last year to look at how much time our management is spending on uh, compliance issues. And when we look at that time, we see that it's more than 30%. So 30% on average is spent on compliance, and that is satisfying the requirements of the DPA. And that's why, you know, when we target exiting the monitorship by the end of this year, the monitor will decide that, but we're feeling pretty confident that it'll be a big step forward in having more time to allocate to customers, to driving the company forward, and delivering on our commitments. Another element we promised was uh, SG&A. If you look at the curve, um, you know, 87 million, we're down 12 million on the same quarter one year ago. We're down 27 million uh, on the same quarter in 2016. That line continues to move down, and our commitment was to be on an annualized basis at 7.5% SG&A by 2020, no matter what the top line was. Yeah, so we will manage that line. Um, that's down from the you know, 10.5 on average we had in 2016. That's the 300 basis points we showed you in the strategy. We're moving, we're on track, and it's working. Another key element is uh, BTOP. BTOP is our internal productivity program. BTOP is driving productivity. It comes into play throughout the company, and it comes into play on some very key projects. Um, Duncan Hall, who is uh, running our uh, Northwest uh, Europe division, is going to show you an example of how BTOP has been able to help him turn around a loss-making contract into a profitable contract. We measure BTOP in euros, but also in the number of projects. And on the left, you see the ramp up. A slow start in Q3 2017, tremendous progress into Q1 2018. And then, of course, one month later, April there, you see 425 measures the number of projects is picking up. Not all of these projects are large projects. The pie chart shows you uh, the makeup, you know, over a, a million, but what I like are the small ones, the ones in the range zero to 50,000, because this is contribution from lower levels in the company, and only when the lower levels contribute is something like this really sustainable. Speaking of sustainability, uh, we've been working on our culture. Uh, driving this performance culture, not only through BTOP, but also through KPIs. Uh, the management team is in place. Most of them are in the front row here. Uh, in the year gone by, we've been able to change KPIs, more focus on cash, 
We also changed that to reported cash and not to adjusted cash, so real cash in the real world. And we've also been able to introduce a four-year um, equity-linked program, which will incentivize and does incentivize top management at levels one and two below the guys you see on the board to contribute and deliver to results. At the end of the four years, um, they can earn a bonus equivalent to one year's salary, but paid in stock. And the appreciation of the stock price on the way goes into their pocket as well. It's a significant number, and I think it's having the desired effect. I'd like to turn quickly to the markets, because the markets are getting friendlier. If I start on the right, the maintenance markets, MMO, uh, we see that you know, predominantly in the North Sea, you know, Duncan's division, a lot of customers have pushed maintenance programs. They're now feeling a little bit richer. Oil at $75 a day, Brent price is generating uh, cash flow, balance sheets are being rebuilt, and cash means projects that have been delayed will come out of the pipeline, we will see more activity. Chemicals and petrochemicals, mainly in uh, Gerald Pilotos division, so continental Europe, is a stable business. You see that our customers, you know their names, are making good profits. They're investing, not in expansions, but in brownfield improvements, emissions or productivity improvements. Energy and utilities has been low in Europe, but we see good opportunity in Middle East. Uh, and finally, metallurgy, you know, that's been a, a mainstay. Uh, aluminium in Scandinavia, aluminium in the Middle East, we like that business. On the project side, ENT, oil and gas, I think downstream uh, oil and gas in, uh, in the US is driving chemicals. Uh, we see a lot of activity, especially in construction. Braskem is one example. A project we're just finishing, uh, I think one of the largest methanol plants in the US, 5,000 tons a day, also just finishing. And we have a strong pipeline of projects coming our way. So we feel confident in oil and gas and the downstream effects. Energy and utilities, uh, project work, nuclear. You know, nuclear. It's kind of uh, you know, down in Germany, but uh, bear in mind that in the UK there are 11 new reactors planned in five projects. The first of those is Hinkley Point, and we're very close to securing a deal on Hinkley Point. Pharma and Biopharma, Tobias uh, Eitel is here, who runs our pharma uh, or biopharma uh, division. He will show you that, uh, or I should say business, not division. He will show you that business. We like it because it's growing double digit for the last three years, and I hope the next three years too. Yes, Tobias is nodding, I like that. Um, I could talk about projects all day. I mentioned Linda, uh, EDF is good because uh, it's one example already last year where you know, four Bilfinger companies came together to give one value proposition to the customer. We have more of those in the pipeline. On the left, also scrubber innovation, Michael will talk about. I like innovation, especially on companies that have to switch their focus from you know, the dying coal-powered uh, you know, electricity generation business to new innovative fields. That is one example. Yes, you know, old dogs can learn new tricks. Uh, on the MMO side, uh, I think most of these have been shared with you. It's known. I'd like to move on to the, uh, the sexy part. And I don't want to take away too much because uh, Franz Braun, our chief digital officer sitting in the front row, is going to give you in-depth view of digitalization uh, this afternoon. He's a techno guy, so I'm going to give you the commercial version. Uh, and beginning, I think, with the internal looking uh, digitalization. We showed you the slide in 2017, electronic workflow. Most of you kind of nodding, said, yeah, yeah, uh, we get it. Uh, that's good. You need something like that. We've taken it to another level, internally as well as externally. Internally, we began with industrial tube. And this is really the ability to capture learnings in video, translate them into any language, put them onto a hollow lens, Google Glass, whatever you want to call it, the, the glasses there on the left, and have either virtual or augmented reality. It allows you to drive your maintenance performance. It allows you to see things that weren't visible before. Uh, we do that inside of our cloud, and now more and more customers want to participate in that. So it's become a service that we've offered not only internally to drive our business, but also we're offering to customers. Now, the next one is something um, you know, which I recall from my Linda days. You know, Linda, I not only ran the Americas, but I was also responsible for operations. And in operations, one of the biggest nightmares you have is, of course, an accident driven by the fact that you've not been up to date in your documentation. 
So as plants get older, the drawings get uh, out of sync with the plant itself. And therefore, the ability to be able to take drawings, drop them into a scanner, and have them turn into a, a 3D digital model, this is quite unique. We have that capability. It's called the PID graph, and it's driving a lot of interest, not only from internal customers, but also from external partners who want to get a closer view because they have the kind of problems that I mentioned that I saw at Linde. Now, that PID graph also means we can take old drawings, drop them into the scanner, and turn them into a 3D digital model. I'll show you why that's important uh, in a couple of slides. But that kind of leads me nicely into digitalization because you know, customers are asking this question every day. Uh, everyone's heard about it, everyone's doing it, but people have different views on what is important. For us, the, uh, the big question we answer is in the bottom right hand of this slide, how can I increase overall equipment efficiency? That is getting more out of the equipment, sweating the assets more uptime, less downtime, higher quality, more output. That's real money in the customer's pocket. And they come to us because we're already in those plants. We have 25,000 blue collars around the world, most of which are in uh, process plants. And the customer then says, well, you've done it before. You have references. Bill Finger, can you do it for me? Can you tell me what it means for me? And the first of those references is uh, a job we began quite some time ago, about a year and a half ago now, in uh, Munzing in Germany. Uh, Munzing is a, a chemical plant, mid-size. Our target is small to mid-size enterprises. And uh, Munzing told us, you do whatever you want, you know, have at it. I'm not paying for anything, but uh, you can do whatever you want. And we took them up on that offer. Uh, it's really our playground. And in a very short period of time, we've done tremendous things. So just over a year later, working from the bottom up, you know, we've improved the data quality by 30%. We've reduced unplanned downtime by 5%. That's real money. We reduce routine walks, walking around, finding out if something is open, closed, shut, leaking, whatever, by 10%, again, saving operators. And the real good one is uh, we've identified 10% in OEE improvements. That is a kind of a B-top for our customers, you know, transforming, uh, transforming operational performance into bottom line performance. And that customer uh, is really our biggest salesperson when it comes to answering the questions of new customers. We think the market is huge. Um, name a number, it's bigger than that. Yeah? So what we did, we went back to our marketing model. Uh, we said that just in continental and northwest Europe, there are 16,000 process plants, roughly 4,000 of those in the small to mid-sized company range. One of our projects, end-to-end, -end, is typically one to two million euros. So multiply that, you know, 4,000 by 1 to 2 million euros, you come to a big number, in this case, for uh, 7 billion. Not to say we're going to add 7 billion to our revenue line, but just to show you there's a huge market out there. And the nice thing is no one is addressing it. We are. Why do I say no one's addressing it? Because, you know, when I look at, um, you know, what's been done, um, you know, online, uh, there's financials, you know, you can go Amazon, you can go uh, any number of uh, online catalogs and shopping. You can go to automotive. Uh, what you can't do is process industry online. No one does it. We're doing it. So we're in the plants already. Uh, the customer sees that. The customer says, I've got my IT on one side, right side of the, the page. I've got my OT, my operating technology, on the other side. Can you bridge the two? And of course, the answer is yes, we can. And that's why, you know, as uh, Sebastian says, you know, we've gone from building bridges made from cement to building digital bridges. Yeah? And this really is neat because we're filling a, a big demand and we're filling it in a unique position currently. So what exactly is that and what is it commercially? Well, our BCAP, our Bilfinger Connected uh, Asset Performance, so sweating assets, uh, really has a different business model to our typical maintenance or our project work. We have a business model that has four discrete phases. Phase one is consulting. We actually go there and uh, it's as if we were McKinsey, BCG or Accenture. We charge by the day and we give the customer an answer. What does digitalization potentially mean to them? We tell them this is a light solution, a middle or a top end solution. They decide what they want. If they want to go ahead, we connect their plant. That's phase two. That's classic engineering. We go in there with our engineering colleagues and we connect the plant. 
Number three is we build within the cloud the algorithms, the apps, the customer needs, ultimately. And then number four is really a licensing model where we've connected these data lakes together and we provide the customer a dashboard. On that dashboard, he gets to see a number of things. Uh, we call it descriptive, what's happened in the past, predictive, what's going to happen, and here's the, the real kicker, prescriptive, what are my options? Yeah, if I know something's gonna happen, what can I do about it? Yeah? And again, that's unique because we're in the plant, we understand the process, we understand the customer's needs. You will have seen that we've uh, you know, tied up with a number of uh, big names. Um, we like big names because you know, this is a big business. I mentioned that big number to you. Uh, we're getting a lot of pull, not only on digitalization, but pull through to our uh, maintenance contracts. Uh, we've teamed up with uh, Siemens uh, to model the, uh, the digital twin. Microsoft provides the cloud security in particular, most important to our customers. And most recently, we've now connected with uh, Software AG to drive the, uh, the, let's say, the input-output network to you know, draw the data from the sensors. If I were to look at that uh, from a very simplified technical point of view, and I'll go over to the chart, you know, on the right, we've got the classic uh, you know, IT system, SAP, Oracle, whatever. On the left, we've got the OT that's already there driving the plant. All this exists and is working. Now, the, the problem is that these sensors can be many tens of years old. Some of them can go back to the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, some were installed last week. And putting on top of that an agent that can communicate, translate that signal language, this is what is being provided uh, with our partnership with Cumulosity with Software AG. They drive the input into the cloud. The cloud delivers data into the BCAP cloud. The digital twin, Comos, helped by PidGraph, yeah, drop the old hand drawings into the machine, uh, communicates with the, the real-time data, we develop the algorithms, and then out comes the dashboard, descriptive, predictive, prescriptive. It's quite simple, and it's uh, a lot of fun, I guarantee you, and Franz will show you some of that later on. I'm almost done. I think it would be remiss if I didn't uh, remind you that uh, in your sum of the parts calculations, uh, we also have a very large position with Appleona. Uh, that was the sale of our building facilities business in 2016. Uh, we retain uh, preferred participation note, 49% of the profits of their eventual sale. Uh, we don't inflate that very largely in our numbers. Uh, you see that it was an investment of 195 million euros. Today, our book value is 210, marginally higher. It also has a, a vendor financing, 100 million with 10% compound interest. So 10 million in year one and uh, you know, 11 million in year two, also a nice number. When they exit, we'll make a lot of cash. We expect, we hope, we anticipate. And of course, that is a tremendous driver to our sum of the parts model for Billfinger. To conclude, I'd like to take you back to one more slide from 2017. At that time, it didn't have the the uh, green check marks, we said our strategy would be a long way. It's not an overnight fix, it's a marathon comprised of many small steps. Sometimes we do two forward, one back, but we do make progress, and I think uh, you've seen that, a little bit of what I showed you, you're definitely gonna see it when the colleagues step up on the stage and show you the rest. But as we've gone through this, you know, we've uh, added our check marks. Uh, the one that's open here on the stabilization phase is operating performance improved. If we get the third quarter green, positive from uh, ENT, we're on the way. You know, we're not yet in the margin bandwidth we want to be. We do have issues, uh, but we're now a lot more robust than we were. So when we do have small issues, you know, we can take care of those within the larger picture. That was not the case a year, definitely not the case two years ago. We're on the way. We're moving into build up and already in build up, you know, check mark one, top line growth resumed, something you questioned. Uh, you also question cash, I understand that, and therefore three from the bottom, adjusted free cash flow positive latest in fiscal year 2018. We're working towards that. It's part of our ambition for this year. We think adjusted cash flow, we will be positive, and entire cash flow positive is our plan for 2019. Uh, getting the compliance uh, DPA behind us is an important milestone, as I've uh, shared with you. And I think we're positioned well. We stick to our guns. We stick to our uh, guidance for 2018. I've shared with you a little bit of insight on 2000, uh, 
18, quarter two, we're feeling confident there. And I think we're feeling confident on the rest of the plan. So with that, I would say thank you very much for listening. We're going to take questions at the high level. But of course, the real good stuff comes later when my colleagues in the front row do their stuff. Huh? So thank you for listening.